So our first topic is ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy outside the uterine cavity. Anything that interferes uh, with the movement of the ovum can lead to ectopic pregnancy. The most important risk factor for ectopic pregnancy is pelvic inflammatory disease because it causes inflammation and it can lead to adhesion formation in the fallopian tubes. So that's why it can lead to the development of ectopic pregnancy. So a patient, uh, what will be the presenting features of ectopic pregnancy? The patient will present to you with lower abdomen pain and tenderness. Uh, lower abdomen pain and tenderness can also be caused by gynecological conditions such as endometriosis, fibroids, and pelvic inflammatory disease, and ovarian torsion as well. But in case of ectopic pregnancy, there will be a history of a recent history of amenorrhea. So, a female with lower abdominal pain and tenderness with no menstruation for six to eight weeks. and a vaginal bleeding and cervical motion tenderness. Then you will suspect ectopic pregnancy. So a female with lower abdominal pain and a recent history of amenorrhea plus minus vaginal bleeding, you will suspect ectopic pregnancy. And the initial investigation that you will do is to perform a urine pregnancy test. And if urine pregnancy test is positive, then it means she is pregnant. Now we will confirm if the pregnancy is inside the uterus or it is outside the uterus. So after urine pregnancy test, we'll do a transvaginal ultrasound to look for intrauterine pregnancy. And if transvaginal ultrasound shows an empty uterus, then we have two parts. An empty uterus means the suspicion of ectopic pregnancy is high because the uterus is empty on transvaginal ultrasound and urine pregnancy test is positive. So to confirm that it's a ectopic pregnancy or not, we have two pathways. One pathway is for the patient who are hemodynamically stable, and one pathway is for the patient who are hemodynamically unstable. Remember that <clears throat> rupture of ectopic pregnancy can lead to internal bleeding, so the patient may develop hypotension and shock. So if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, means his systolic blood pressure is less than 90, then the ectopic pregnancy has most likely been ruptured. <clears throat> and we have no time to perform tests such as beta HCG. So we'll do urgent laparotomy. So the initial investigation that is done is urine pregnancy test. If that is positive, then we'll do a transvaginal ultrasound. And if transvaginal ultrasound is showing an empty uterus. Then we have two pathways. One is for hemodynamically stable patient and one is for hemodynamically unstable patient. What will you do if the patient is hemodynamically stable? We'll check his beta, heart beta HCG levels. If beta HCG levels are less than 1400, then we'll wait and observe. If the beta HCG are less than 1400, then it's unlikely ectopic pregnancy. because a normal pregnancy can also cause high beta HCG level. So a beta HCG level of less than 1400, uh, uh, un the pregnancy is unlikely, topic pregnancy, and the fetus may be so small that it is not observed by the transvaginal ultrasound.
and if beta hcg levels are more than 1400 then we'll do laparoscopy and not laparotomy so in hemodynamically stable patient we we'll do laparoscopy to confirm and to treat ectopic pregnancy in hemodynamically stable patient laparoscopy is done but if the patient is hemodynamically unstable then it means ectopic pregnancy has ruptured and we will do urgent laparotomy the risk factor for ectopic pregnancy include pelvic inflammatory disease is the most important risk factor endometriosis previous tubal surgery and assisted reproductive treatments so these are the risk factors for ectopic pregnancy because all of them uh, interferes with the clopping tubes of the uterus so that's why they can lead to ectopic pregnancy the most common risk factor is pelvic inflammatory disease and uh, the management of ectopic pregnancy we have three options uh, to manage an ectopic pregnancy there is a medical management there is laparoscopic removal and then is and surgical removal so salpingectomy or removal of the fallopian tube it can be done through an open surgery or it can be done through a laparoscopic surgery as well so we have three options for the management of ectopic pregnancy one is medical management second is laparoscopic salpingectomy and third is laparotomy or open surgery so when we will go for which option so the indication for medical management with methotrexate methotrexate inhibits nucleic acid synthesis so that's why it can be used for medical management of ectopic pregnancy then uh, we'll go for uh, methotrexate if uh, the size of ectopic pregnancy is less than 30 mm patient is hemodynamically stable and asymptomatic for mild symptoms such as mild pain So hemodynamically stable patient with no symptoms, it can be treated medically with methotrexate. Same patient with symptoms, a hemodynamically stable patient with pain, then we'll go for laparoscopic salpingectomy. And if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then we'll go for laparotomy. So for hemodynamically unstable patient, laparotomy. Uh, for hemodynamically stable patient, we have two options, either medical management or a laparoscopic removal of the ectopic pregnancy. A hemodynamically stable patient with no symptoms or is managed with, uh, managed with methotrexate. And a hemodynamically stable patient with pain, significant pain, he will be managed through laparoscopic. So, what are the signs of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy? If the patient is hemodynamically unstable or if his systolic blood pressure is less than 90, then this is one sign that the ectopic pregnancy has ruptured. Another sign of ruptured ectopic pregnancy is uh, presence of fluid in the Pouch of Douglas. Pouch of Douglas is basically an extension of peritoneal cavity that is present between the rectum and the uterus. So an extension of the peritoneal cavity that is present between the uterus and the rectum is called pouch of Douglas or rectouterine pouch. So if an ultrasound shows free fluid in the pouch of Douglas, then this is another sign 
to confirm that the ectopic pregnancy has ruptured. So remember uh, these two signs, if they are present, systolic BP, blood pressure of less than 90, and free fluid in the pouch of Douglas or the uterine pouch, then the ectopic pregnancy has ruptured and the treatment for it is laparotomy. So this was all about ectopic pregnancy, its diagnosis and its management. Is it clear everyone? If uh, there's any question, then people can ask. No questions. So who will repeat the management of ectopic pregnancy in hemodynamically stable patients? Mm, you have two options if the patient is stable. Uh, medical management, which includes methotrexate or uh, surgical management, which is uh, laparoscopy. Leptoscopic salvinectomy. So, uh, what are the indications for medical management of uh, ectopic pregnancy? Um, if, if the patient is stable, that means their systolic BP is 90 or above and you don't find any fluid in the pouch of Douglas because those are signs of um, ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And also you check the beta HCG levels. If they're less than 1400, you wait and observe because it could be um, a normal pregnancy. But if it's above 1400, then you go ahead with the, the paroscopic self-injecting. So when will you go ahead with methotrexate? When will you use a methotrexate in a top of pregnancy? Um, I'm not sure. You are the use of uh, methotrexate. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the patient should be hemodynamically stable, stable and no significant pain whatsoever? You can say that a symptomatic patient or with mild symptoms and hemodynamically stable. Okay. So we'll use methotrexate. And if a hemodynamically stable patient has a significant symptoms such as pain, then we'll go for laparoscopic. Uh, <clears throat> there's pain. <clears throat> Uh, then it means uh, the size of the ectopic pregnancy is larger and it cannot be managed medically. So that's why if there is no pain, it means the ectopic pregnancy is smaller and it can be man managed medically. And for your knowledge, remember that if uh, the size of the ectopic pregnancy is less than 30 mm, then it will, it will not cause any symptoms and it can be managed medically. With method So our next topic is molar pregnancy. Molar pregnancy or gestational trophoblastic disease. Trophoblast, remember that uh, there are two parts of the placenta. One is fetal part of the placenta and one is maternal part of the placenta. The fetal part of the placenta is formed by the trophoblast itself. And the maternal part of the placenta will be formed by the decidual cells or villi, chorionic villi. So there are two parts of placenta. One is uh, fetal part which is formed by the trophoblast and one is 
<clears throat> maternal part that is formed by the distribual and chorionic villi. Remember these two points, and because molar pregnancy is also known as gestational trophoblastic disease, so as its name indicates, excessive proliferation of trophoblastic cell or abnormal proliferation of trophoblastic cell will lead to molar pregnancy or gestational trophoblastic disease, GTD. Now, what is the mechanism of why does these trophoblasts proliferate excessively? And there's a reason behind that. Normally what happens uh, during fertilization that a sperm and an ovum combines to form a fertilized egg. Sperm contain one set of paternal chromosome and ovum contain one set of maternal chromosome. And they had two combines to form 20, 46 chromosome. Uh, this is known as normal conception. It will lead to the development of a normal fetus. So this is a normal process. Now what happens in gestational trophoblastic disease? There are two scenarios. That two sperm combine with an empty ovum or empty egg. So two sperm combine with an empty ovum. Empty ovum means maternal genes are not or maternal chromosomes are not present. So all of the 46 or all the two sets are from the father or from the paternal side. So it will lead to excessive proliferation of the tropoblastic cells and there will be no embryo. If this happen, a complete mole will form. There will be no embryological tissues, only molar tissues or trophoblastic tissues because two sperm have combined with the or one sperm has combined with the, an empty ovum and then the chromosome has duplicated and result in the formation of 46 chromosome. So if both of the set of the 46 chromosome 23 and 23 are from paternal side, then it will result in the formation of a complete mole. Now, what will happen in a partial mole? How a partial mole will form? In a partial mole, what will happen is that you can see that two sperm have combined, combined with an ovum, which is not empty. It is having a 23 chromosomes. So there are one set of gene from maternal side and two set of gene from paternal side. So a total of 69 chromosome will be present in the fertilized egg. Because one set of maternal gene is present, so it will result in a partial mole. Partial mole means some of the tissues will be present that will be embryological. The fetus will be present or the fetal tissue will be present, but the fetus will be non-viable. So this is the pathophysiology of gestational trophoblastic disease. Normally 23 chromosome for father and 23 for mother result in the formation of a fertilized egg that contain 46 chromosome and a normal fetus is formed. But if a sperm fertilized with an empty egg then what will happen for two sperm combined with an empty egg, what will happen? The 46 chromosome will be from the father. So it will result in the complete mole and no fetus will be formed. And another scenario is that two sperm combined with an egg 
and two sets of gene there will be three sets of gene two from father and one from mother because mother genes are also present so a fetus will be formed but it will be non viable and due to two sets of genes from the father a partial mole will form so gestational uh, trophoblastic disease there are four types of gestational trophoblastic disease gestational trophoblastic disease uh, there are two types which one can be benign which has further two subtypes one is complete mole and other is partial mole and it can be malignant again divided into two subcategories one is invasive moles and one is chorioparcinoma so gestational trophoblastic disease can develop into chorioparcinoma as well so in total there are four forms of gestational trophoblastic disease complete mole partial mole invasive mole and chorioparcinoma remember these four types so gestational trophoblastic disease can be complete hereditary form mole partial hereditary form mole gestational trophoblastic neoplasia such as invasive mole or <clears throat> chorioparcinoma because both of these types invasive mole and chorioparcinoma they are malignant so along with uh, surgical management chemotherapy is also required how will we confirm our diagnosis of a hereditary form mole and what is the presentation of hereditary form mole or gestational trophoblastic disease vaginal bleeding in first trimester of pregnancy so uh, you all know that uh, miscarriages can also present with vaginal bleeding in first trimester of pregnancy so gestational trophoblastic disease uh, is also a differential diagnosis of vaginal bleeding in first trimester of pregnancy but because there is a excessive proliferation of trophoblastic cells so the uterus will be large for date so this is one important point with general bleeding in first trimester of pregnancy with large for date uterus you will suspect gestational trophoblastic disease because excessive proliferation of trophoblastic cells will cause a large for date uterus and due to excessive secretion of beta hcg by these excessively proliferating trophoblastic cells the patient will have excessive mouth vomiting or hyperemesis so remember these three points for general bleeding in first trimester of pregnancy with large for date uterus and persistent vomiting or severe vomiting you will think of hereditary form mole or molar pregnancy or gestational trophoblastic disease and you will confirm your diagnosis by doing an ultrasound what are the ultrasound findings in hereditary form mole there will be bilateral cystic masses in the ovaries bilateral cystic 